Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, the podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Ryan L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Michael J. Z. Mannheimer, Professor of Law at Simon P. Chase School of Law, Northern Kentucky University. We will discuss his article, The Unusual Case of Anthony Shevatoris, The New Deal for Crime and the Federal Death Penalty in Non-Death States, which will be published in the Syracuse Law Review. So welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Yeah, no, love to have you on and um, really found this paper interesting for a number of different reasons, both because of its kind of timeliness, but also because of a lot of the really interesting historical observations that that you make in it. Um, so I was wondering for listeners who may not be, you know, kind of death penalty knowledgeable in a sort of technical sense, if you could talk a little bit about why there's a tension between federal and state death penalty law, uh, in especially in relation to like federalism related issues, and why that tension is especially salient right now. Yeah, so um, the, the federal death penalty obviously uh, applies in all 50 states or purports to apply in all 50 states. Um, but of course, there have uh, been non-death penalty states since the middle of the 19th century, and now um, there are 20 non-death penalty states. So we have this tension where uh, if someone commits a crime uh, in a non-death state that 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 it could be a federal that could be charged as a federal crime, and the federal government seeks the death penalty. There's obviously this you know, federalism tension where the, the people of the state have this decided uh, we don't want the death penalty here, but the federal government comes in and says, no, this is a, a death penalty case. Um, and it's it's gotten, um, uh, the, the tension has gotten exacerbated in recent years because the federal government has um, uh, enacted so many statutes covering what are essentially um uh, you know, local crimes or what we would consider local crimes. So, for example, um, the Hobbs Act, if someone commits a Hobbs Act robbery and uses a gun and kills someone with a gun, that's a Hobbs Act murder and that can be um, prosecuted in federal court. But the Hobbs Act uh, basically at this point, I, I think, arguably covers just about any robbery because it's a, it's a, a, a robbery that affects interstate commerce and it obviously effect, uh, covers robberies of commercial premises, um, but arguably you could say if, if, if I'm robbed on the street, um, you know, the money in my wallet comes from interstate commerce. So one could make the argument that that is a Hobbs Act robbery. Same thing for kidnapping. These days, um, a, it, it's a federal kidnapping if the kidnapper uses the means, instrumentalities, or channels of interstate commerce, which includes you know, cell phones, computers, cars. So if they plan the kidnapping out using something like that, or they use a car in the kidnapping, it's a federal kidnapping. And so if a death results, um, that becomes a federal case. So we've had, um, since 1993, um, uh, at this point, 80 cases in which the federal government has sought the death penalty for crimes committed in non-death penalty states, and they've obtained death sentences in 11 of those cases. Some of them have been vacated or reversed on appeal. I think there's about five or six now where there are active death sentences, um, including uh, probably the most well-known would be the Boston Marathon bomber case. Um, and there's also, I'll just... Um, add that there's one case where the Justice Department had scheduled the execution for uh, last month, uh, a case uh, involving someone named Dustin Honkin, who killed five people in Iowa, and he was convicted in federal court in Iowa. Iowa doesn't have the death penalty, hasn't had the death penalty since 1963, I think. Um, and he was scheduled to be executed, but those executions have been put on hold uh, for different for, for uh, for different reasons, uh, for reasons that don't apply here. Um, so, so a lot of my um, 
scholarship in the past um, has been on sort of the doctrinal issues involved here and whether we can read the cruel and unusual punishments clause of the Eighth Amendment to forbid this type of thing. And spoiler alert, I, I argue that, that we can read the Eighth Amendment in that way. My argument is that when they wrote cruel and unusual punishments, uh, what they meant, at least in part, was a punishment not recognized by the state in which the crime occurred, because, of course, at that time, the, the clause applied only to the federal government. So it's sort of natural to think of unusual as being, you know, not authorized by state law. Um, and in this piece, this is a very different piece. It's more of a, more of a legal history piece. Um, and so I'm looking at the only case in American history so far where um, someone has actually been executed for committing a crime uh, in a, 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 for committing a capital federal crime in a non-death penalty state. Um, and his name was Anthony Shevatoris. Well, so maybe you could say a little about kind of Anthony Shevatoris, sort of who he was and what he did that led to his conviction and ultimate execution. Yeah, so I won't go through all the details. I have the trial transcript, which was really kind of a fascinating read. Um, but in essence, he and an accomplice uh, tried to rob a bank in um, September 1937 in a town called Midland, Michigan. And Midland, Michigan uh, is and was famous for being the home of the Dow Chemical Corporation. Uh, they decided it would be a good idea to rob the bank on the day that the um, the Dow uh, people would be coming in for the payroll because uh, they knew the bank would have a lot of cash on hand that day. Uh, they went into the bank. It did not go well. Uh, they ended up not getting any money. Uh, two people in the bank were shot and they survived. Um, but ma in making their escape from the bank, um, uh, there uh, a, a dentist who had his office above the bank. This is sort of an interesting story. He, he had a, um, a rifle in his office um, in the expectation that someone someday might try to rob the bank. There were a lot of bank robberies in these days. And he heard the commotion going on. He saw these guys leaving the bank, realized they were had tried to rob the bank, and he started shooting at them. And uh, Sheba Torres doesn't know where these shots are coming from. And he sees this guy uh, standing on the sidewalk wearing a chauffeur's cap with a visor. And I think the theory is, although this is not totally clear, but the theory is he, he believed that this person was a police officer and was the one who was shooting at them. And he shot this innocent bystander. And unfortunately, the uh, bystander died um, a couple of weeks later. Um, and so Sheba Torres was uh, indicted. Uh, the, the accomplice was killed, uh, uh, but Sheba Torres survived, and he was indicted for the, for the bank robbery, um, and he was prosecuted under the Federal Bank Robbery Act in federal court, and because someone died, uh, the federal government sought the death penalty, and the jury uh, in, 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 uh, in Michigan, uh, they, they came to the conclusion pretty quickly that Sheba Torres was guilty of the murder, um, it took them a few hours to decide whether to impose the death penalty, but ultimately they did impose the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the crime, the federal crime for which Sheva Torres was, was charged and convicted was relatively novel, it seems like, at the period of time in question and was part of a kind of broader uh, Roosevelt crime, well, Roosevelt and earlier, I guess, crime-related federal project, which – you refer to as the new quote unquote New Deal for crime. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of what the New Deal for crime was, what was motivating it, and how, if at all, it related to what we usually think of as the kind of New Deal for economic recovery. Yeah. So, I mean, the reason I wrote this article was both to sort of unearth the Sheva Torres case because a lot of people had never heard of it, um, but also to sort of situate the Sheva Torres case in this sort of um, wave of um, centralization of the government that occurred upon the election of FDR in 1932 and you know into the late 30s. Um, so 
you know, before that time, the federal guard, there were, there were a few federal crimes, obviously. There was the Dyer Act, which forbade taking a, uh, an automobile across state lines. There, um, there was the White Slave Traffic Act uh, because of the you know, panic about uh, women and girls being kidnapped and sold into sexual slavery in the early 20th century. Um, and then, you know, right before FDR was elected, there was the Federal Kidnapping Act, which was passed in large part because of the Lindbergh baby kidnapping, although that was that would not have been a federal kidnapping at the time because the baby was never taken across state lines. Um, but again, there was sort of a moral panic at the time. Um, but that was, you know, pretty much the extent of uh, federal crimes that sort of overlapped with state crimes. Um, and then FDR comes in and his attorney general, Homer Cummings, um, and a couple of his close advisors, um, you know, have this project of not just building this new deal based on, um, you know, in, in enhanced economic regulations by the federal government, but, but also a new deal for crime where they would um, enact new federal statutes. So uh, strengthening the Kidnapping Act by by uh, providing for the death penalty. Um, uh, uh, there, there's a firearms provision in there that you've actually written about, so you know about that. Um, and uh, the and, and uh, statutes dealing with robbery and extortion, and the Federal Bank Robbery Act. So you know, before this, a bank robbery would be a robbery under state law, just like any other robbery under state law. Um, but the federal government decided, well, we're now going to be insuring, um, you know, federal funds through the FDIC, um, and all these banks are part of the Federal Reserve System. So let's make it a federal crime to rob a bank. Um, and and you know, to be honest, there had been a spate of bank robberies around that time, as I said, you know, as prohibition sort of waned and then uh, was repealed, um, organized crime figures, uh, you know, they had to turn to something else because prohibition was really lucrative for them. Uh, but once alcohol becomes legal again, you know, they need to find a new line of work. Um, so they go into kidnappings. And of course, then you have the Federal Kidnapping Act and they go into bank robberies and uh, one of their favorite things was to rob banks that were near state borders because bank robbery was not a federal crime uh, at, you know, in, 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 until this time. And um, they could rob the bank and then get across state lines and, and um, you know, be, it would be a lot harder for uh, you know, local police to, to catch up with them. Um, so, so, yeah, this, this, this uh, New Deal for Crime um, was sort of a 12-point project that the administration had that was that they were pushing sort of at the same time as the, the, new, the new deal that we're more familiar with, the new deal that we study in law school. And I think, you know, part of the reason we don't study this part of the new deal in law school is because no one was really against it. Um, there were a few dissenting voices in Congress, really just a handful. Um, and on these things, they didn't even take a vote, a, 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 a roll call vote. They, you know, they just took a voice vote. It was, you know, was, there was overwhelming support for this expansion of the federal government into criminal law. Um, you know, unlike in the economic realm where you had uh, big companies fighting tooth and nail because they didn't like the regulations. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, the big, big business uh, was all on board with. Um, uh, uh, you know, new federal criminal law, uh, because as I said, a lot of the federal, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of the, the, the criminal activity at the time was aimed at, you know, banks um, and, you know, large corporations and, and, and the kidnappings were aimed at, you know, the wealthy, because those were the people who could pay a, a nice ransom. Uh, so there was really no one who was against this. And it, it, it didn't really get challenged in the courts very much, un, unlike the, uh, you know, the famous cases that we learn about in law school. I mean, what do you think about that? Do, do you think that the New Deal for Crime had 
sort of from the Roosevelt administration's perspective, motivations consistent with the economic New Deal? Was it perhaps driven by alternative factors? And like to the extent that there were concerns, what kind of concerns were were raised? I mean, it seems at least mildly surprising that people who at least purported to have principled objections to the New Deal on federalism and due process grounds wouldn't have expressed similar kinds of reservation about, you know, arguably congruent expansions of federal power in the criminal area, especially insofar as, if anything, criminal federal criminal law was more unusual and less developed at that point in time than federal regulation of economic matters and commerce. Yeah, so um, a great question. I mean, certainly within the administration itself, there was really no um, second guessing this. Uh, and they did see it as sort of part and parcel of the New Deal. Um, in fact, Homer Cummings kind of went on the road to tout the New Deal for crime. And he would also, you know, in many of his speeches um, and radio addresses and things like that, he would he would uh, talk about both at the same time. He would talk about the economic New Deal and the New Deal for crime and and sort of conflate the two. And, uh, and you know, and they really did go together. Um, I, you know, the, the, the underlying premises of both are, you know, really that, you know, we, we're a national community. Um, it's you know we 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 we've got the automobile automobile we've got radio we've got the airplane and so the country's getting smaller and so we should really think of ourselves as one big national community rather than a bunch of you know states or a bunch of local communities and so that premise sort of i think undergirds both the economic new deal and the new deal for crime uh and 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 they wanted people to see themselves as part of a larger community and my sense is that um that really succeeded at the time uh you know i think people have started to rethink that uh but but that they really succeeded in 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 getting people to buy into this idea of one big national community um the few dissenting voices um, there were there were actually some more, more dissenting voices back in 1932 before FDR was elected um, when they were considering the Federal Kidnapping Act and such um, illustrious people as you know Felix Frankfurter who was then a, a professor at Harvard um, you know spoke out against the Federal Kidnapping Act he he thought the federal government should not be involved in this. Um, the attorney general at the time, uh, William Mitchell, who was um, Hoover's attorney general, uh, he he wrote a or he gave a radio address uh, arguing that that they they shouldn't pass the Federal Kidnapping Act. In fact, suggesting that they couldn't pass the Federal Kidnapping Act because it was barred by the Tenth Amendment. Although he he ultimately um, you know advised Hoover to sign the bill rather than veto it. I think he, he had very principled objections to it, but he was pragmatic in, in that, you know, Congress was sort of overwhelmingly in support of the Federal Kidnapping Act. The country was overwhelmingly in support of the Federal Kidnapping Act due to the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. And it was 1932, so it was election year. Uh, so, um, but by the time FDR gets in, in 33, and then the, the, uh, the crime bills come up in 34, there really isn't much dissent in Congress. As I said, there's a couple of congressmen, a couple of senators who, who dissent. And um, yeah, you know, why, why weren't they, you know, why weren't they challenged by um, criminal defense lawyers? It, it's, it's a question that really haunts me because I haven't been able to find too much on, uh, or really anything at all on, on criminal defense lawyers arguing that these laws violated the Constitution, um, I think we have to realize criminal defense was not what it was, you know, back then it was not what it is today. Um, not everyone was appointed an attorney. Shepard Torres was appointed to quite good attorneys, I think. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the, it, the, the judge was on record as having said that he hadn't appointed any attorneys in any case in the past 10 years. Um, and Sheba Torres you know, was appointed a couple of good attorneys because it was a capital case. Um, Sheba Torres himself 
did not even appeal his death sentence, which is mind boggling. Um, I mean, and by today's terms, it's mind boggling. Um, and there's some dispute over why that happened, but I think it's probably because uh, he, he just didn't want to appeal and his attorneys could not convince him to appeal. Um, and so it, it was never even tested in his case. I mean, there were no objections on constitutional grounds in the trial court either. Um, so I think people were really buying into this idea that, you know, by, by, by 1937, which is when the Shevatoris um, uh, uh, trial occurred, people were really buying into this idea, at least in, in, with respect to, to uh, federal criminal law, that, you know, this is, this is fine. This is, you know, we're, we're all one big national community. And they did, you know, they did take baby steps, right? They, they, um, they, they, they criminalized interstate kidnapping. They, inter they criminalized bank robberies. So they didn't quite have the extensive federal criminal law that we have today. But this certainly was sort of a, a foot in the door, uh, which is, uh, is why I think it's important to look at. Well, so coming back to Shabatora, were there any objections to his execution based on the conflict between federal and state law? Uh, and how did the federal government go about resolving any objections that people might have advanced? Yeah, so that's a big part of the story, too, that we haven't talked about yet, which is um, – in Michigan, um, the, the governor of Michigan at the time was Frank Murphy, who um, uh, your listeners may know later became attorney general of the United States and then later justice on the Supreme Court, uh, writing you know some famous opinions in, in dissent in Korematsu and, and Chaplinsky, the fighting words uh, doctrine case. But he was the governor of Michigan at the time. He was uh, stridently anti-death penalty. He was Catholic, and that was part of his belief system. He was very anti-death penalty. Michigan had not had the death penalty since 1846, uh, which was um, – they were the first English-speaking jurisdiction actually to get rid of the death penalty. Um, although – and this becomes important later – they the, uh, Michigan did um, – uh, hang on to the death penalty for treason, but but not for anything else, not for murder or any other crime, but for treason. And uh, you know, one wonders how you commit treason against the state of Michigan. Maybe you root for the Buckeyes. I don't know. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but in any event, uh, Murphy, the relationship between Murphy and Roosevelt and Cummings, who's the Attorney General is an interesting one that I get to into in the article. Murphy was a strong supporter of FDR, strong supporter of the New Deal. And in many ways, Murphy kind of owed his um, political existence and his and his political future to FDR. Uh, you know, Murphy was the, the mayor of Detroit. He had very high aspirations. And um, FDR picked him ultimately uh, uh, Murphy got in with FDR because um Paul Roosevelt who was Eleanor's brother happened to be in Detroit and Murphy and Hall Roosevelt knew each other quite well and so uh, Murphy got into the FDR circle that way uh FDR appointed Murphy to be um governor general of the Philippines which at that time was a very important post, a very lucrative post, and a very high-profile post, um, and that so he gained national prominence by becoming Governor General of the Philippines. Um, later, came back and ran for governor uh, in 1936 on um, FDR's urging because FDR was worried that he was not going to win Michigan. Michigan was a very Republican state um, up until 1932. Um, and FDR was worried he would lose Michigan, and he, he wanted Murphy to run for governor to help uh, the FDR ticket uh, out. As, as it turned out, FDR actually won Michigan by a much greater margin than Murphy did. So, so it turns out that FDR actually helped Murphy win the governorship rather than the other way around, or at least one could m make that assumption. Um, but so getting back to the Shevatoris case, Murphy was the governor, and uh, about – Two weeks, 15 days or so before 
the execution was to take place. The execution was to take place July 8th of 1938. And on June 22nd, 1938, Murphy writes this um, letter to FDR. And it's unclear. And I've looked to see if there's anything else before this. I couldn't find anything. Uh, but, you know, it's, so it's unclear when Murphy became aware of the Shevatoris case. It, it, it occurred, you know, while he was governor, uh, the trial occurred. But in any event, uh, Murphy writes to FDR about the upcoming execution and says, uh, you know, basically, look, we don't have the death penalty in Michigan. It's kind of a, um, it's kind of a slight, you know, for us to, to have an execution here. Could you, could you please um, commute the, the death sentence to life in prison? You know, we really don't believe in the death penalty here. Um, or at the very least, could you move the execution outside of Michigan? Um, so he sends this letter on to FDR. FDR passes the letter on to his um, uh, attorney general Cummings, but, Cum but he would, but Cummings was on vacation at the time. Um, and uh, so it, it gets uh, shuffled through the Justice Department and ultimately FDR responds um, by saying, you know, sorry, we, um, I'm not gonna commute the sentence, um, but I will look into, or I'll have my people look into whether we can move the execution outside of Michigan. So he kind of punts it back to the U.S. attorney uh, in, in charge of the case, who's a guy, a guy named John Lair, who was the U.S. attorney who tried the case. And he meets with the judge, Judge Tuttle, uh, apparently ex parte. They, they meet for like three hours <laughs> and they discuss whether the execution can possibly be moved outside of Michigan. And the result of that is they decided can't because there's a federal statute that was passed just the year earlier, 1937, that says that when there's a federal death sentence, um, the, the death sentence has to be carried out in the way provided by law of the state where the crime occurred. And now you're thinking, well, Michigan doesn't have the death penalty. But as I said earlier, Michigan did have the death penalty for treason, which, of course, they never you know, uh, carried out. Um, but you know, technically, Michigan still provided for the death penalty for, for treason. They provided for the death penalty by hanging. And so uh, John Lair and Judge Tuttle decided we can't move it outside of Michigan because the federal law is mandatory. It says it has to take place in the state um, where it occurred, if that state has a death penalty statute, and Michigan technically did have a death penalty statute, and it has to take place by the means of execution provided for by the state. Um, and just as an aside, that's the statute or the, the successor of that statute is the one that's being litigated now in the Honkin case, which I mentioned earlier, and the other federal death cases where the Justice Department has scheduled executions because the defendants are claiming um, you know, that the execution has to take place based on the lethal injection protocols of the particular states where the crimes occurred. The federal government is saying, no, it, it, the you know, method of execution just means lethal injection. It doesn't mean it has to go according to the precise protocol of each state. You know, the federal government can have its own protocol, but that's the litigation going on today. Um, but in any event, um, Judge La I'm sorry, John Lair and Judge Tuttle decide that the execution has to take place in Michigan. This is July. Uh, we're coming up on the execution already. It's July 6th, I think. And Judge Tuttle, interestingly enough, issues kind of a press release, which, I mean, there are a lot of weird things about this case, but that's one of the weirder ones because federal judges typically don't issue press releases. But there's this one page, un, undated, untitled, uh, unpaginated uh, uh, document in his files, which I went through, that gives his reasoning for why the execution, it's not an order or anything, it just um, doesn't even have his name on it. it. It just, you know, gives the reasoning for why the execution has to take place in Michigan. And so two days later, July 8th, 1938, Shevatoris is hanged. Um, and, and Frank Murphy, uh, Governor Murphy, uh, you know, ma made some noise to the press, um, you know, both before and after the execution. Um, but, um, you know, apparently was, um, you know, was not able to change FDR's mind 
Or as I argue in the paper, it, you know, the, I, 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 it's, it's a little bit of sort of educated speculation, but my, my sense is Murphy could have tried harder to stop this execution. Um, and some evidence we have of that is that a few years later, um, uh, there, there was a, uh, another federal defendant in Michigan who, this is during World War II, who had helped a German POW escape out of Canada and into the United States. And, and he was tried for treason in federal court and sentenced to hang by the same Judge Tuttle. Um, and in that case, now Justice Murphy on the Supreme Court has the ear of FDR, but doesn't have to worry about his future because his future is set. Um, he he persuades Murphy, along with a couple of other people, but but uh, I'm sorry, he, he persuades FDR. But Murphy was really instrumental in persuading FDR to commute uh, the sentence um, of this defendant. And, and you know, 12 hours before the guy was about to be hanged, FDR commutes the sentence to, to life in prison. So my sense is that Murphy, like I said, could have tried harder, but he didn't want to burn bridges. He didn't want to press sort of a state's rights argument with FDR because that was really inconsistent with his credentials as a New Dealer and as a, an acolyte and, and a, a disciple of FDR. Um, so, you know, he wrote this one and a half page letter to FDR to um, salve his conscience, conscience. And, you know, I think he really did act in good faith. I think he really um, uh, was, was opposed to the death penalty and certainly was opposed to having an execution in Michigan. Um, but my sense is he could have done more and, and, you know, had he done more, he might have been able to convince FDR to uh, commute Shevatoris's death sentence. But, you know, we'll never know. <laughs> well, so, Mike, in closing, I wonder if you think there are any lessons we can draw from Shebatoris today in relation to the current dispute. I mean, do you think it stands for any kind of precedent suggesting that uh, federal executions in non-death states are legitimate? I mean, obviously, it's not a direct precedent. Or, I mean, arguably, do you think it kind of stands for the opposite in states that don't have any kind of death penalty at all, even the treason one, like the one that that Michigan had. Um, and sort of what, if anything, do you think that Sheba Torres can tell us about, you know, the death penalty and federalism? Or was that just not present enough in the case or in the minds of the people deciding it to really tell us a whole lot about how we should think about it today? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I guess I was a little surprised when I looked through the files and the archives, and I, I, I really couldn't find, you know, too much on uh, people pressing sort of states' rights argument, you know, except for Murphy to a very, like I said, to a very small extent. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it could be used as precedent both ways. Um, like I said, people sort of thought of these federal crimes as as being okay. We're all part of a national community. This is sort of a small incursion into state sovereignty. Um, and, and I think, you know, obviously even more so today, um, when we read about uh, a federal death case uh, in a non-death state, take the Boston Marathon example, because there were so many articles about that that pointed out you know, in, in in paragraph 18 of 20 of a, of a newspaper article pointed out, you know, Massachusetts doesn't have the death penalty, but it's OK because the federal government does. And this is a federal case. So people don't even really think about uh, those federalism concerns, uh, uh, certainly to the extent, extent that I have. <laughs> um uh, So, I, you know, it could be it could be argued. Well, you know, just the Shebatoris case shows that we can just do this, right? It, it you know, we, we can have the federal death penalty in non-death cases. Um, on the other hand, you know, I've exact, you know, I've, I've argued for, uh, as a doctrinal matter, as a matter of constitutional law, we, we, we can't do this. Um, but even if uh, people are not willing to accept that argument, um, I, I think Sheba Torres, uh, might stand for the opposite proposition that, um, you know, the fact that it's the only one that we can point to where this has happened in 230 years, right? 
uh, of our history, only only a single time has someone been executed by the federal government for a crime committed in a non-death penalty state. Maybe 230 years is uh, sort of an exaggeration because we didn't have not non-death penalty jurisdictions until 1846. So fine, you know, since 1846, this is the only one uh, where where someone's actually been executed, and and even. Uh, you know, before 2002, you could say he was the only one who had actually been sentenced to death. Um, so, you know, I, th I think you could say it stands for the proposition that generally the federal government has been solicitous of local feelings about the death penalty. Um, and I think that certainly was true for quite a while up until about 2001, when uh, John Ashcroft became attorney general and made some changes to the death penalty protocols at the Department of Justice. Um, but for a, a huge chunk of our history, the federal government has been sensitive to the idea that some states don't want the death penalty and the federal government really should not be intruding in those states and you know implementing the death penalty in those states. Um, however you feel about the death penalty, and you know, I'm, I'm actually not against the death penalty. I think it's appropriate in some cases. I have some qualms about it, certainly. But the, the point is, the death penalty is really something that reasonable people can disagree about. You know, whether it works, whether it's moral, whether it costs too much. Um, and, you know, it's, to me, it's a local issue. Issues of crime and punishment are, are generally local issues. And the federal government, you know, to, to my mind, should be deferring to the states on this. So I, I, li I like to think of Shebatoris as, you know, the exception that proves the rule. You know, it only happened once <laughs> and it shouldn't happen again. Awesome. Well, Mike, Mike, yeah, Mike, thanks so much for sharing the fascinating paper. Um, I really enjoyed it and enjoyed talking to you about it. And I hope that listeners will check it out because there's a lot more to the story that we weren't able to get to in this conversation. Thanks, Brian. number of people recorded this one. It was written by Otis Jackson, but we're going to play a version that the Soul Stars recorded for Aladdin Records. This was before they were on specialty, and long before Sam Cooke joined them. This is when R.H. Harris still led the band. Here they are, and they're going to tell you why they like Roosevelt. Tell me why you like Roosevelt. Oh, man's tell me why you like Roosevelt. Oh, man's tell me why you like For him at night, but she knew that the president didn't arrive. The time of day was 12 o'clock. Tell me that Elizabeth had to stop. Grit and God Almighty, she started too late. That is why this was called that unfinished poetry. Tell me why you like Roosevelt. Tell me why you like Roosevelt. Tell me why you like Roosevelt. He was a good president. Tell me. About 1.30, had a several image at the world of muddy. They call Atlanta or Washington to light. Cause he was act light and a call went through. Call long distance to notify why Dr. Bruin said he died at 3.35. And great God Almighty, was no bell to toll. Less than 30 minutes, the world was in moan. I cried about Roosevelt. Oh, and I cried about Roosevelt. Oh, well, I cried about Roosevelt. Oh, you are the good. 
demonstration, Congress assemble. Great and God Almighty, the poor tremble. The rich who will ride in the automobiles. Depression made poor people rob and steal. But the next door to our bill of need wasn't getting anything for their hard labor. Great and God Almighty, there were moonshine stealing. Brought about a crime, we were robbing and killing. Now the other presidents made us moan. Roosevelt stepped in, gave us a comfortable home. That's why I like Roosevelt. That's why I like Roosevelt. That's why I like a Roosevelt. He was a good president till the Why you like a Roosevelt? Tell me why you like a Roosevelt. Tell me why you like a Roosevelt. He was a good president till the end. During the Roosevelt administration, Congress assembled. First time in history, pondered a Negro general. General Benjamin O. Davis, I'm trying to relate. First Negro general of the United States. Racial prejudice, did he try to rule out by the Negro leaders into the White House? He advocated the fair practice of labor to let the poor man know he was our emancipator. Made Madam Bethune, the lady of the land, made part of his will, Mr. Pretty Man. Endorsed inventions of Dr. Carver. This is why they say he was an earthly father. He took my feet out of the Mara Clay House. Had to look back at the WPA. That's why I like a Roosevelt. That's why I like a Roosevelt. That's why I like a Roosevelt. He was a good president till the end. I have told you the history of Roosevelt life. The world can say that he left a sweet wife. Hasn't been so worried since she were a girl after Roosevelt's death. What would become of the world? She knew they fought a son across the sea. Don't you all get worried about poor me, but keep on fighting for victory. Your father is dead, but you all are grown. I would worry about your father, but the world's in mourning. Sad about Roosevelt. And it's sad about a Roosevelt. And it's sad about a Roosevelt. He was a good president till the end. Well, great God Almighty, look at what a time. England has Churchill to resign. The fighting through the European war so hard. Put him out in the hands of the Almighty God. His success was at to lead. Great God Almighty, what history. Only two presidents that we ever felt. Abraham Lincoln and Roosevelt. Which Roosevelt could live to see. Oh, glory waving over Germany. But God Almighty knew just what was best. He knew that the president needed a rest. His battle done for big. On one, our problems have just begun. When your burden gets so heavy, you don't know what to do. Call on Jesus, he's a president to it. Sad about a Roosevelt, and it's sad about a Roosevelt, and it's sad about a Roosevelt. He was a good president till the end. That was the soul stirs. Why I like Roosevelt.